Okay. Uh, anything interesting that you guys want to share with the classroom today about anything that you saw outside? Sir, here? Uh, that you promise again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are actually going to see promises today, too. It's just in a, in a slightly different context, but we're dealing with promises nonetheless. Uh, yeah, anything else? Who was? Nice. That's cool. That's cool. Let's 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 show let's show everyone. Uh, connect the unplug unplug your charger. Leave the USB C. Actually, I don't think I don't think we can do it this way. You want to talk a little bit about how you achieve that? Um, I, to, to hide the, the punchline for each one is I built a, ca a card that would flip around in 3D uh, so to reveal the punchline on the back side um, and then reload brand new jokes um, future functionality I'd love to have these, these cards actually also animated in like they're being dealt onto uh, the felt uh, that I used in the background um, but uh, let's head over to my So to make that work, each one of those cards uh, is sort of built three times. So it's, it's a micro container to, or a, 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 a main container, um, which allows me to put everything in it and so I can move the card around if I want to. I build everything inside of that box. Then there's the card, which is designed just basically to hold the front and back sides of the card. Um, and the fronts and backs of the card, as you can see, are pretty much empty because I push um, I push my, my P tags into the, the front and the back, um, specifically set up for the setup uh, and the punchline. And I did that three times, uh, so I can have three cards. Um, and then there's my button down there at the bottom. Uh, JavaScript. Um, there's my fetch setup here, um, which brings up a big joke. Um, and I built it all under an if statement. So, so like we defined it, I basically made a checker to see if there were p tags inside. If there were p's uh, in there, then if there are no p's, I'm basically building it for the very first time. And uh, actually, oh, Joey's not here. Uh, Joey gave me the heads up because I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to, uh, to like, because I'm just throwing nameless p tags in there. Like, like, how do I overwrite them? How can I even select them? How can I find them again? Um, but you can actually uh, give them an ID by just defining them. By, by, so so I, I first defined joke setup uh, and made it as created an element as a p tag. I uh, got the joke setup dot id and named it joke setup one, um, so I could find it thereafter. Because uh, after you do this whole loop, and again the other trick was too after getting a, uh, I used the, the URL of the you would set up, um, which uh, actually was was already preset for three. It's grabbing three, but it's at an index. That was the other trick. Um, so it's it's uh, setting it up a text. 
which is something I defined earlier, uh, at um, index zero dot, dot uh, setup. Um, to flip. Let me head over to my CSS. Um, <laughs> with a lot of different things. Um, all right, so I'm trying to debug this stuff. The main container. So the main container itself is positioned with relative, um, and it's built in, that's what's defining the card size. Um, everything else, the card itself, the front of the card, the back of the card, all have to be done with position uh, absolute uh, with width and heights up to 100% for the size of that container. Then, um, you have to make sure that the card itself is preserving 3D. Um, and what that does uh, is very simply like, imagine you've, you've made yourself a sandwich with two slices of bread. Uh, and if you don't have uh, preserved 3D, your sandwich is two slices of bread side by side. So if you flip the card, all it's gonna do is flip one side of the piece of bread. So you won't see, the, you'll, you'll actually see like, the rever it'll reverse the text, it'll just flip that. But if you flip preserving 3D, it flips the sandwich. So you get the backside of the card. If that makes sense. Um, I did an ease uh, for the transition so that it would, uh, it would, it would look like it wasn't a snap right over. You'd see a little bit of an animation when it flipped. Um, on the front of the card, I did some fun stuff. Uh, like on all the actual um, nice looking things, like these rounded edges. Uh, and the drop shadow, I built, uh, built on the front and the back of the card, um, specifically with box shadow, uh, denoting, oh, I forget what these go, I think it's, it's uh, size of the shadow, like the, how wide, how big it is, how offset it is, and how blurred it is. Those were the three parameters. Uh, so it's, it's 10 pixels bigger, 10 pixels, pixels like down and off centered, uh, and five pixels worth of blur. Um, and for some reason, when I did it on the front and back of the card, it like automatically went to white, so I had to denote it as black uh, mm -hmm. to make it a black drop shadow. Um, I don't know why that happened, but I was able to get around it. Um, the border itself, obviously, is rounded, so that way I could get the, I did the border radius of 20 pixels, uh, but I had to do it on both the front and back of the card. Um, but the biggest trick for, there it is, there it is. So the back of the card, you have to preset, rotate it, um, so it's automatically flipped to the front of the card. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you reversed it, it would start off when you reload the page showing the, the, the other side of the card. Um, and then when you do your hover, uh, you just put the exact same transform, uh, which is simply rotating the y-axis, which is uh, the, the, the horizontal, yes. No, that's horizontal, vertical. Um, by 180 degrees, flipping it completely over. So that's the, the hover parameter. And there's other stuff on the fix here. Uh, but I don't want to take up all the class time. <laughs> so I can. Thank you. That's great. Cool. Yeah, anytime that you guys do something interesting that you want to show the entire class, feel free to uh, tell me beforehand. Um, or we could do it at the beginning. Um, and then you come up here and, and show us what you learned. What you discover. Um, that's pretty cool. I, I have zero experience with um, animation in CSS, so it's pretty cool to see it. Um, thank you for sharing. So, today we're going to be working with promises. Was that sound? I, I, uh, I was playing some music, but anyway. Um, yeah, we're on YouTube. Okay, so today we're going to be, this is going to be an introduction to Axios uh, and something called async await. Um, Axios is a module that uh, it's a chunk of code that somebody else wrote uh, that we can use to make network requests. So Axios is a uh, replacer um, or alternative to fetch 
and XML HTTP request. Um, once we get to React, we're gonna be uh, doing more of actions. But here we just want to give you an introduction to it. Um, you are for the unit two uh, final assessment, you are free to use uh, fetch XML HTTP request or Axios to make your network request. Um, and we want to introduce you to Axios because it's, uh, uh, it has, it's more predictable, it's a little bit easier to use, uh, and it also has a very intuitive API. Um, and that's what we're gonna get to talk about. Has a, yes, a very simple setup, uh, a really nice feature of Axios is that it automatically parses the JSON so that we don't have to do like JSON.parse or uh, response.json, uh, for instance. And another one is that it, it works is a uh, cross environment, meaning uh, Axios will work in Node and in the browser. So I mentioned this briefly um, before, which is fetch and XML HTTP requests are available in the browser. They are not available in Node. In fact, let me see if I can uh, show you that quickly here. If I go, if I inspect this page, uh, you can see that I could do fetch, right? And well, it, tell, it tells it, sh it throws an error because of the because I'm not passing the value value here. But we can see that. Let's do it again. Uh, fetch. You can see that fetch is a function that is defined in the browser. Same XML HTTP request. They are both uh, functions that are defined that we could use in the browser, right? So our JavaScript runs in two, um, we can have JavaScript run in two places, which is the browser um, for front-end development and Node for back-end development. And for instance, another example was the command line handman game that you built. That was running in Node. And we're, we're learning Node. In the next unit, we will be learning Node to create our own backends, create our own servers, create our own APIs. So, so here, what I'm saying is fetch and XML HTTP requests are available in the browser. If I go to, if I go to Node, and I try to type fetch, it throws a reference error. Fetch is not defined. Note that we don't get that, we don't get that error in Node. You can say they're not Node compatible. Um, Axios, as we uh, are going to get to see, will work in both places, so that is, that is really nice to just have Axios, um, and that doesn't matter where our code is running, uh, we'll still be able to make our network request. We could make network requests with Node uh, without Axios, um, but it's a little bit more complicated. We could still do it. Um, Node also has something built in, um, the HTTP module that could uh, allow us to make network requests. We're not gonna get to see that. Um, so, okay, so fetch XML HTTP requests. Oh, the nice thing about this too is that they are built into the browser, right? Um, if we want Axios, note that if I do Axios here, Axios, I get reference error Axios is not defined. So Axios does not come with the browser. We will need to install it. Uh, or we, we need to import it rather than install it. Um, so, okay, so just to recapitulate, um, Axios is um, a module just like you guys remember uh, Gridline Sync, right? That was another module that we were installing, that we were importing, that we didn't write, somebody else wrote for us uh, and shared it so that we could use it. Same with Axios. Axios, uh, we can see here, uh, let's do Axios JS. And if, in fact, this is not, most of these modules are not just written by one person. These are written by um, sometimes even thousands. Now here we can see that Axios, this is the Axios GitHub repo. Uh, so this is where like the people that wrote Axios. 
see that there is 80, 182 contributors. Um, and these contributors not only count code, I think this code, uh, this uh, counts code review, comments, um, and patches that you do. And this here, um, just like the way that we keep our apps in GitHub, um, the developers of Axios keep their module on GitHub. And then you can inspect, you can see here how Axios was built if uh, you are interested in that. Um, yeah, so here uh, we can see, for instance, in the documentation, the browser support. Um, Axios will run on all of this. This is another nice reason for using Axios. It's very compatible with all the browsers. Um, I think EA, this Internet Explorer 11 might not have fetch. I'm not sure. Um, also, if you go to fetch and the end, the fetch API, um, in MDN at the bottom, you have this option or this menu browser compatibility and it's gonna tell you uh, where, uh, where fetch is available. So we can see that this is the, this is the page for fetch um, and fetch is available on Chrome, Edge, Firefox, but not available on Internet Explorer. So that is if we were building an application uh, where we know that some of our users or a good chunk of our users are gonna be using Internet Explorer, uh, we'll probably want to use Axios since Axios is supported there. Oh, we can see that. Um, cool, so here we can say like how to use Axios. Uh, this is to install it. We're not gonna uh, do this now. We're gonna use a different method. Uh, we're gonna use this method, which is our CDN. Um, yeah, so these are different ways to install it. But here we're gonna use this, so it turns out that Axios, it is just a, since it's a, a, a chunk of code that somebody else wrote, they made it available so that you could just import this script and, and your HTML and be able to use Axios. So that's what we're going to get to do. Um, so right now what we're going to do is, I'm gonna create two files. Let me see where I am here. Um, let me get out of here. I want to copy this and I want to take this to core in two axes. Um, okay, you know what? Let's go to my main folder, which I keep CD core, CD unit two. And here I'm gonna do create a folder called Axios. And I'm gonna CD into Axios. And here I'm gonna create two files. I'm um, gonna call it uh, Axios, no, index that HTML and index.js. Uh, created two files. I'm just going to open this with VS Code. Uh, we have these two files. In here, uh, we're just going to have some HTML boilerplate. When you, type, when you guys type HTML, do you see this popping up? Yeah. So this is this is really cool. Uh, I th I think this is may this might be Visual Studio Code only. Um, when I type here and I hit enter, I select the second option. I hit enter. It adds a bunch of uh, yeah HTML boilerplate. Um, so it gives me sort of some scaffolding already where uh, it makes the body for me, a head, a title, etc. So this is just nice. Otherwise, you could just create it manually. Um, we just need an HTML a head with a title um, and a body. Here, what we're going to do is, wait, everyone has an HTML file where they was, where you're gonna start playing with Axios. Just create an, create an HTML file. Yes, I mean. 
the second one, yeah. Say that again? Uh, how do you get it like to prompt? When you try HTML, you don't see it? Let's pick the second one, HTML5. This is called, and I don't know how you pronounce this, like image? Abbreviation? And then this sort of uh, gives you this boilerplate for us. So everyone has an HTML file. It doesn't have to be exactly like this one. It just needs to have a uh, HTML tag, a head, and a body. Everyone has the HTML file? OK, so I'm going to change this to Axios uh, lesson. And here, so in this HTML file, I'm going to take um, I'm going to take the URL that I found in the uh, access documentation to use it, copy this script, um, type in, the, in your browser, type in access.js to get to the repo. Uh, also, this link is also in the lecture notes. Um, and here, as you scroll down, you will find the uh, script tag. So I'm going to copy this um, script tag and paste it here. And that's it. Oh, I'm also create another script tag for my, for my own JavaScript. It's just that my own JavaScript is going to come from my computer. Here. So here we have two script tags. One is bringing in Axios from this URL. And the other one will bring in my JavaScript, my own JavaScript file. Yes, Peter? It doesn't get confused. It will still read top to bottom. So the first one, um, we want we want the oh that's a that's a good point. That brings me to we want the Axios first because our index.js will use Axios and Axios must exist before we can use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make sure that you have the Axios uh, import script before the other one. Okay, everyone with me here. Too fast. Um, now I'm going to open my index.js and here, actually, no, let's open this in the browser. I'm going to open uh, this page in the browser with uh, not opening terminal. Um, revealing finder. Uh, some of you, are, some of you do like in the terminal open HTML file. That's uh, that's still fine. I do this uh, more manual and lab labor's way. So, so far we have an empty HTML file, right? But now if we go to inspect, uh, we go to the console, and we type in Axios, maybe it will have something. Yes, now it has something. Now Axios is a function, and we can see what it is or some of it, uh, where as if we're on a different page, this, I change to the GitHub page. I don't think the GitHub page is importing Axios. So if I type in, uh, if I type in Axios here, I get on caught error. Axios is not defined. So the script tag, that script tag that we added from Axios is, is uh, importing, is bringing in uh, the code uh, from Axios, and we can see that we could access it here in our console. So now, uh, this is just to verify that we get Axios correctly imported, that Axios is defined. I think this is the name of another uh, Greek mythology god or something. 
Yeah. The Macedonian river god. Okay, so everyone was able to see Axios in their console. Uh -huh. Sure. So here, do you have this script? I grabbed this script from the Axios documentation. Make sure that uh, once you open your index.html um, and you inspect and go to the console, you're able to type Axios and you see, um, you see this function. Oh, wait, where do we go? Let me reduce the zoom. I think this is a little bit too much. When I type in Axios, oh, this is too small. It's right here. Is it still readable in the back? Maybe one more, that. So here, when you type in Axios in your empty HTML file, you should see a function popping up. And that's because Axios is a function, just like fetch uh, an XML HTTP request. Questions here so far? Yes. Is this putting a package or something in your folder, like, uh, Similar, yes. In, in this case, is not this code is not being saved in a folder. It just gets imported for the lifetime of our page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time every time I refresh, actually, you can see this in the network tab. If I switch to the network tab here and I refresh, oh, uh, make sure that you have the all selected. Make sure that you have here the filter. There is no filter. Or in fact, you could do the all or the JS. Um, if you do the JS and you refresh, you can see that there is now two files being imported, two JS files. One is yours, the index.js, uh, and the other one is the axios.min.js. We can see here where axios.min.js came from. This is the URL. So by importing that script, the browser has to go to this URL and fetch a JavaScript file from here. In fact, if we visit this URL, we're going to see something interesting. I copied that and I pasted it here. We get this, which is, um, <laughs> which is Axios. This is how beautiful Axios is. <laughs> so, yeah, this is... Um, this is called like this axios is it's, this is actually a thing like it's called uglifying your code and it's something it's a sad practice that we have in web development uh, because you you build an application and you don't want to you don't want people to figure out how it works so you you uglify it um, and it looks like this uh, well another reason why you do this is to save space to you know have this um, take less lines and therefore transfer faster. Uh, so that it's not only for hiding code and, and making it hard for people to figure out how your code works. Um, but yeah, like from here we can figure out how this works, but it's gonna be hard, right? Anyway, this is Axios. This is if it's actually not that much. Um, we, I don't have to scroll that much, but this is the code that is gonna let let us uh, make a network request. From the browser. Uh, so cool. So we imported that. Now we are ready to use Axios. Um, let me check out my notes here. Yeah. Cool. So we imported that. Now let's use Axios for our first get request. So Axios is really straightforward. Um, let me just switch this back. I'm going to go to my index.js that I linked here. Make sure that you have the link. If not, it's not going to work. Um, the usual uh, document that added don't listener to the DOM content loaded. The 
the usual over here. Now I want to load, I want to make a network request to get a list of um, to-dos the, from the to-dos API that we have. Um, but I'm thinking if I should do that in a button maybe or as soon as the page loads. Let's do it as soon as the page loads, which is if we have a console log here, this console log um, will run once the DOM has loaded. Now if I go to my console and I refresh the page, I see exactly when the DOM was loaded. Oh, a fun thing, do you want to see how long it takes the DOM to load? We could do sort of what, the same way that we measured the time yesterday. Let's do start, call date.now, and then when DOM loads, we do let end date that now and then we do here end minus start this should be an amount um, so here this line will run um, immediately as the JavaScript file is imported and then this inside of the DOM content loaded will only run once the DOM has loaded and I want to see how long it takes for the DOM to load. Uh, so I take the time, so basically this is like, I start a, I keep track of, this is similar to, you know, a timer that you use for um, keeping track of a lap. Here I'd say, keep track of the time that is currently, and then after that, I have another variable and I ask the same question, or I, I say the same thing, which is, uh, what time is it now, and then we just rest, uh, subtract the end uh, from the end, the start, and we should see the milliseconds. Oh, that's really fast. One millisecond, it takes the DOM to load. And sometimes it takes zero. This might be because, well, our DOM is not very heavy. Right? We don't have a lot of documents, uh, of uh, elements in the DOM. So this makes sense. If we had something else, um, Maybe, maybe you can try it later on on your own application and see how, many lists, how, um, how much it takes to load uh, your, your DOM, your particular DOM. Uh, this room and this takes one millisecond, that's really fast. Um, cool, so the DOM has loaded and in, in here what I want to do is as soon as the page loads, I wanna fetch, a, I wanna fetch some to-dos from the to-dos API, so I'm gonna call it I'm gonna create a function here called get to do's. Uh, this function doesn't require any input, uh, at least as I see it right now. Um, and here, if we wanted to use, uh, so here we wanna make a network request, right? We wanna make a network request to the to do's API. We would use fetch normally or XML HTTP request, right? Now we're gonna use Axios. And we use Axios by saying Axios dot, and then what, what comes followed by the dot is the method that we wanna use, the HTTP method. The method that I wanna use is get, axios.get. And then here, axios.get is a function and to this function, I need to pass an argument that is the URL uh, where my to-dos are. Um, that URL, I forgot, so I'm the do HTTP, I think is slash API slash to-dos. Uh, I'm gonna visit this URL here, and then I'm gonna copy and paste it. I'm gonna send this on Slack for you, so that you don't have to type it. Yeah. Here we got our all our to-dos. Um, so I'm just gonna put that in here. Actually, I'm gonna put this in a variable. Let URL equal, and then save the URL to a variable, and then just use URL.
Okay, so what did uh, fetch return when we were looking at the return value of fetch? You guys remember? Fetch, when you do like variable a or let a equal fetch this, what would a contain? I mean, a, a promise, that's correct. So access that get returns a promise too. Let's look at that. Let um, promise equal access that get. Then let's console log promise. Oh, and also, so yeah, we do want to do that. And the next thing that we want to do is uh, call our function get to do's as soon as the DOM content loads. This will be as soon as we refresh the page, uh, call my function get to do's. Um, and then console log prompts. Uh, so let's do that. Re refresh, and we get our old friend the promise. What state is this promise in? Pending, right? And we can see in here, we can also see if we go to the network tab now, I'm gonna go back to XHR, to the filter XHR. Now as I refresh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slow down the network to see it a little bit slower. As I refresh, I see no network activity, but after some time, there we get, it's, um, this is the network request that went out. For a second, it was stand, uh, pending, and then after that while, it came out 200. And if I inspect the network request itself, uh, I go to the response. Seems like this is my data. Let's go on preview a little bit better. And we got um, a lot of to do's. 37, I can see here, but maybe more. So our network request. Uh, succeeded, we can see it here, uh, but we're still not able to access the data, right? What did we have to do when we were doing fetch to access the data in a promise? Parse, but I said, I said at the beginning, um, uh, Axios will, will do the automatic parsing of JSON. But inside of what did we do the parse? Joanne? The then, that's correct. So we need to uh, have a dot then um, to sort of wait for the promise to resolve. So here I, I'm gonna do, so okay, we saw that access return a promise, we could just forget about this uh, variable here. We just got, got the test resolved successfully. And in here, Axios will give us the data that came back in the response. Then we can do console.log data. Now go back to your browser and refresh your page. And what do you see? Who wants to share what they saw? Cameron? So the promise on the data was not defined. Well, the promise, yeah, is not defined because I removed it. I removed that variable promise. 
Well, data should be defined. Data should be. That it said the data was not defined. Are you sure to use the same name here? Yeah. So this this function that we're writing inside inside of the dot then this anonymous ES6 function that we're writing here uh, will receive the data, the actual uh, data that came back from the API. And here, oh, actually, you may be. I might be wrong on saying the actual data. We're going to see. Uh, I'm going to do refresh. Oh, I have a slow network. Uh, just complete it. And then we, have, we got this thing popping up here. And this is an object. This is a, an Axios response object. And inside, inside this object, so this is what data is. Actually, I should call this response instead of just data. Yeah, let's call it response. Uh, response is a better name. The data is inside of the response. And I'm going to get back to online uh, for the network speed. Um, now refresh, and then it happens much more quickly. Here, so this is the response. This is Axios, uh, send the request, the request uh, successfully resolved, and now we have a response object, uh, an Axios response object. Now, inside of this response object, we see something similar to what we saw on the fetch response, which is a status OK, um, status text, and a status uh, number, 200. That means it went well. We see some headers, but more importantly here, we see a property called data. And this data here is contains our actual data, the one that we asked for from the API. It contains uh, an object, you can tell by the query brackets, with an error set equal to false and a payload set equal to 38 elements, to an array of 38 elements, where every element in that array is one of our to-dos. So if I want to console log only my the actual data that the API gave me back, how would I need to mo modify my console.log? I mean? Response.data. So yes, that's correct, because the response, this response console log is this entire object. This entire object with one, two, three, four, five, six properties. Uh, and I'm only interested in the data property. I reload because we have fast, uh, fast, fast speed internet here. We see it almost immediately where we get actually the data that we were asking for. As we see, um, API to do's, this is this same data. Same data, payload with 38 elements, payload with 38 elements. Was everyone able to see the to-dos console logged by console logging the response.data? Oh, oh, wait, say that again? Oh, uh, this one? This one? Sure. Questions, comments, ideas here. Jonathan? 
can we drill into the payload? Yes. How can we, you mean, by that you mean just console log like the actual array with all the objects? Yes. How could we do that? Where? Yes. This is uh, the nice thing about objects. You can just keep drilling down until you find the data that you need. Mm -hmm. Yes. Since that's an array, is further beyond payload to target an index number? That would be possible, yeah. Let's target the index number, and just because we know that there's 38, I'm going to target index number 15. And we get um, the 15th, no, we get, we get the, yeah, the 16th element because uh, they will start at zero. And that is this to do here. <laughs> is that, is that, uh, that's part to be, right? Okay, I know that one. <laughs> Um, cool. So yeah. So this is uh, how we make a network request using Axios. Now, compare this to XML HTTP request. That was um, I don't know about ten lines of code. Now we have three. And this is something that you will find uh, very commonly, as somebody else wrote hundreds of lines for us, uh, so that we can just write three. But nothing really comes for, um, nothing, nothing is really magic in here. Somebody did the work, the heavy lifting for us. Um, okay, so, yes, Mike. Sure, yes, we can do that, and let's see this asynchronous behavior because this is still asynchronous code. You know, this is still a promise. Um, let's, let's look at that. So, here, let's create a variable here called const to do's array. Let's start with an empty array, right? Now, um, I'm going to say to do's array equal to the response dot data dot property. The data property of the response is the actual data uh, that we requested from the API. Nice thing here, um, the data property is already parsed. We don't have to parse it for us. It's already an object. Um, and the payload is the one that contains the array. So I'm going to remove this console off from here. Or actually, I'm just going to move it down, and I'm going to change this here. So, actually, let's let's do this. So we have a Compton, we have this console log here on the DOM has loaded. Right. Let's also add a console log here to the get to do's console dot log. Get to do's started. I'm going to copy, copy that and add it to the end as well, saying get to do's ended. Just like this for now. In what order do we expect these console logs to appear in the console? We have three console logs done. Has loaded, finish. Let's do. We have three console logs, dump content loaded, finish, get to do started, and get to do's ended. Peter? Okay, so Peter says get to do started, then get to do's ended, and then dump content loaded, finish. That's right. Refresh. And you're right. We get get to do started, end it, and then dump content load it, finish. All right, this shouldn't be const, this should be let. 
Okay, so this is because, well, JavaScript first is the, the content uh, loaded, the dumb content loaded. After that, it goes on to execute get to do's. Get to do's console logs, get to do started. That's why we see that. Um, then this happens. And lastly, we get get to do's ended. So is it clear why we're seeing this order? This order makes sense. Okay, now let's see what happens when we do here. Console.log, uh, let's say data arrived, or response. Response arrived with data. I'll save that and refresh the page and tell me the order in which you see the console logs happening. The which one? The response arrived is at the bottom. Let's uh, make sure to save, refresh. We get the response arrived with data is at the bottom. Let me slow down the network to see that a little bit better. Slow 3G console. So get to do started, get to this ended, and after some time we get response arrived with data. So that is, wait, who could share with, the, with us why that is happening? What, what they think about, why is that happening? Something that I talked about yesterday. But in your own words, you, it doesn't have to be technical language. Like why do you think this is, this is happening? Like we would expect, um, we would expect that response arrived with data will be somehow between get to do started and get to do ended, right? But we're not getting that. Let's hear two opinions, Hugo. Correct. Yeah. Um, yes. Cameron? I will say if you put the time in the table, you see how much time it takes for such a thing. Yes, we could take, uh, we, could, we, could, we could know, we could measure how long it takes. Also, in here in the network tab, it also showed us how long it takes. Uh, somewhere in here, time. It took two seconds. But that's because I'm on a slow network. Um, but yes, it is because this. Um, so JavaScript is reading the get to do function in console logs uh, get to do started then it initializes this variable URL after that it calls access.get and it defines a, um, and adds a callback function right this function that we're writing in here it passes that function to the that then but that function this code here is not being executed until the response arrives, until this promise gets successfully resolved. This is just sort of like definition here. Uh, access.get is execution, right? JavaScript will execute this part, access.get, and then that's gonna go try to get the data from the API, and that then is just a, uh, attaching, the, that then is just sort of attaching this function here uh, for or remembering this function for whenever the response um, or the promise resolves successfully to invoke. Right? But we don't know, again, we don't know how long that's going to take. Right? On a slow network, it, it takes two seconds. In a slow network, it, it gets 
It takes two seconds to, for that to happen. Um, and this code here will not run uh, until the promise has been successfully resolved. Right? Um, but JavaScript doesn't stop here. This is, what, this is why I'm a little bit reluctant to say uh, waiting for the response. JavaScript doesn't stop uh, here until the response arrives. JavaScript continues. And that's why we see, um, because JavaScript continued, that's why we see get to the start and immediately get to the end. Is that sort of here? Uh, I guess an analogy will be something like, um, you know, like uh, let's say uh, um, two people behind a counter uh, uh, in the deli. One is receiving the orders, right? And the people that receiving the order just receives the order and it gives it to somebody else, and it's able to it finishes and it's able to receive another order, right? And this part here, the this part here, or this this part here is sort of as to, yeah, that um, action of giving the order to somebody else to prepare it. And then once that order is prepared, it comes back, uh, it gives the order, and then it's delivered to the client. Uh, but get to this uh, starts. It calls access .get, and then it ends. Then access that get because we have this dot then here. Once the whenever the promise successfully resolves, uh, the JavaScript engine or the browser will invoke this function. And to this function, uh, the browser will pass in the response, which has all the data that we need inside. Um, and that's why we see this response arrive with data as the last thing. Here, let's do this one. Console.log. Uh, this is at the bottom. I'm the entire all at the bottom. Last line executed. I have the last console log on line 20 here. Last line executed. Thumbs up if you think this uh, console log will be the last console log popping up here. And thumbs down if you think this line will be the first line that will be console log. Thumbs up or down? So down means it was going to be console log first. Up means it's going to console log last. And middle, yeah, if you're not decided. Cool. Yeah, so actually I think we got the majority correct. Let's see. Refresh. Oh, I, I'm simulating the network, so it takes some time. But yes, that is the last line that we see. The last line, as we saw earlier, loading the dump takes one millisecond. And JavaScript doesn't stop until the, for the dump to load. JavaScript just runs. Um, it, it's the same behavior here. The same behavior that where we have in this function. This function is being, we're putting this function here um, for the browser to execute later. When later, when the DOM has loaded, even if that's one millisecond after the page has loaded. Um, then we see that they get to the start, they get to the end, and they then come from the other page. So that was just another sort of, so that you start to develop a sense for um, asynchronous and how that behaves. Yes, sir, here. Yeah, so Sergio is saying if I move this console log up here, well, one, I will be lying because the dump content loaded function has not finished, right? Because, well, it has to do this first. It has to do, at, at this point, we know that the content loaded, content loaded uh, listener, at this point, we know that the content loaded, the dump content loaded uh, listener started executing, but it has to execute this too. So I would say the dump content loaded started here. I, I wouldn't say finished because, well, it has to do this thing first. Uh, but yes, this will, this will change the order in which we see uh, this popping up here. 
Mm -hmm. So let's do start and finish. Because, well, or just do this. The JS last line gets executed, the dump content loaded, listener started, right? This is this line. After that, JavaScript went to do the get to do's. The get to do started, then the get to do ended. In the meantime, in these two, in between these two points in time, uh, the get to do's attach a function to the promise to be invoked later uh, when the promise resolves. And then it continues, and then after that we get Done content loaded listener finish. And lastly, after about two seconds on my current settings, the response arrives with the data. Okay, so here, because because of this behavior that we've seen here, um, I think Michael, something you were trying to do yesterday was something like oh, like console login here. Console log here the to do's array. Right? Here we can we, we will think that when we console log um, to do's array here, it would have our to do's. But the answer is uh, according to what we observed, should be no, it will not contain our to do's. This will be the empty to do's array. Why would it be empty? Well, because this line, this function here has not executed yet. We see that the get to do's function starts and ends really quick. Uh, and this part here, this code, this function that we're put, passing into the dot then will not get called until the request um, has been fulfilled. So let's save that. Let's refresh. We get the in the mean, you see, we see it in, in between the get to do started and the get to do ended, we see it empty. So at that point in time, at this point in time, the array is empty. So we cannot rely on setting outside like global variables in um, inside of listener here. I, I anything that has to do. I said this somebody uh, to somebody else earlier. Anything that you need to, anything that requires the data that you just received, will need to exist inside of this dot. Then, inside the function that you pass to this dot. Then, if you need to display the data, if you need to do any transformation to the data, it will have to be inside here, or with a function that you have somewhere else and you just give the data to. But at this point, yes, Mike. Mm -hmm. If you do this, so we define the variable inside. Um, well, since this variable is, is inside, it no longer exists outside. So uh, this will give me. What do you think this will give me? If I try to run this code, will it break? Or it will run. It breaks, saying to do's array is not to, to do's array is not defined, because here this to do's array exists only within this function. It exists only within here. It doesn't exist outside. And here I'm trying to access it from outside, and that is not possible in JavaScript. It's going to tell you that the that variable that you're trying to access doesn't exist, uh, or that is not defined. So again, anything that anything that you want to that needs the data will need to be done here. So if I want to display my to do, so I'll have to do like display to do's. 
to the user. So I'm not going to rely on this to do the array anymore. Well, I was I wasn't in that. So this, I guess. Okay. Any questions or comments so far here? Uh, Cameron. Uh, would I define? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you mean defining this function, uh, defining this variable? Um, like here. Uh, I had it here before. What's wrong? Oh, that nothing like the fact that I. I might rely on it, but we saw that if I if I console log to this array here, we get that it's still empty. Because when at this point in time when we console log here, the response has not arrived. The data has not come back. And we see We see that it's empty. Yeah. But now, what, look at what happens if I console log it here. To do all right. So here, like I think, you know, this is confusing because of we get we we, we are used to JavaScript reading like fully top to bottom synchronously. But here we have asynchronous behavior, which is this runs first. After that, up until this run, up until this run, and then this runs after that. And this part that we have inside of here will not run until we get the response, until the promise has been fulfilled. Now we get this, refresh, and we, get, we, st we still get our empty one there, but because this console log on line 16 Oh, I'm console logging a string. This console log on line 16, at this point in time, we know that we have the data. Uh, we see it in here. We see that last thing. The, the last thing that happens is that the response arrives with the data, and we're console logging the data. So this was just sort of um, to demonstrate again and explain again the asynchronous behavior um, that we have going on here. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I wanted to do, going back to this, um, let's get rid of this variable where you don't want to actually use that as a global variable. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna do the find a variable here, here called data, or actually, if I know that these are my to-dos, I'm going to call it to-dos. Because I know that the payload is an array with to-dos as we inspected it here. Um, here's going to console the to-dos. Uh, let me put this uh, up here. Anything that needs the data will need to be done here, like displaying the to-dos to the user. Um, I'm gonna get rid of the console logs. The console log was just to demonstrate the asynchronous behavior. And we are back. We're back here. Oh, I'm gonna leave this one, console log. So here, we just have, oh, I want to get rid of this yet to do started. We refresh. After some time, we get the console log to do uh, coming from line 13. This is our console log. Okay, 
everyone here with me? If you're not with me, raise your hand and somebody will go up. I'll help you. Um, so here we got the to-dos. Um, now I want you to do this exercise, which is, so Axios is, is really easy to do. It's, more, it's easier than uh, Fetch and it's easier than um, XML HTTP request. Um, one, uh, I guess one disadvantage of Axios is that then we're importing external code, which will make our application uh, a little bit heavier. And why do, you, why do we have to learn XML, HTTP, and fetch instead of just learning uh, Axios? Uh, because, well, it might be that in your project, in the project that you end up building for your employer, uh, they don't want to um, waste any bandwidth, and they don't want Axios as a dependency. Uh, so you need to do either fetch or XML, HTTP request. Um, right. Cool. So, before we see the next thing, I want you to get this same behavior that we have currently, but in the old way using fetch. So here, let's take seven minutes to write this same request. Write the same request using fetch. The purpose of this exercise is so that you appreciate what Axios is doing for you, <laughs> but more importantly, so that you can draw some of uh, the differences and similarities. like get to do with fetch or you can write it uh, here underneath those are two valid options
So the, the two methods should have, the, the two ways should have a, um, a console log and the console log should be identical in the browser once we see it. Oops, sorry. So here we should have like two console logs, console log in exactly the same We have left. Okay, so let's do this with fetch. Um, wait, what? What are some of the things that people found? Malik, I think you found something really interesting. The fetch console log before the axios. Mm -hmm. So what, what Malik is saying is that the access request was dispatched first and then the fetch request, uh, which there are two identical requests, uh, but the fetch uh, response arrived earlier than the access response, uh, which is something that I didn't in, um, intend, but let's, let's look at that. So we just use the same URL here. Actually, you know what, I'm going to do another function, const get to do's with fetch. Gonna be identical to the one before, but just with fetch. I'm gonna need this URL. And then I'm gonna use fetch. Fetch, we pass in the URL. Uh, that then we know that here we get the response. We have to return the response.json to initiate the response. Let's do it like this. The response to initiate the response uh, body conversion. Another that then. Uh, here we actually got the data. Here console.log. So, questions or comments here so far? Um, here, I, I want to stress this again, which is when your callback function, when you're defining a function uh, in, right there in the parameters to another function, and your callback only has one argument, you don't need to pass in this. Uh, you need to specify these parentheses here. I could get rid of them. This is a little bit more clean. But if your callback needs 
two, per, two parameters, so two arguments, you will need to have the parentheses there. If you include them or remove them, uh, it's the same, as long as you have only one argument in here. So, so that's that. Um, cool, let's try this out. Uh, also, I want to do fetch. This is going to be the fetch one. Uh, and I want to do the same, but for the to do's. Uh, or the, uh, this is Axios. And now, so I have two, two functions that will make a network request with, uh, different, in different ways. Here I'm going to call in, the get to do's is the one that is doing it with Axios. And I call get to do's with fetch after. So here get to do's will be executed first. Um, and then after that, they get to do is with fetch uh, is executed. They will end up really quick, right? Because uh, their job is just to dispatch a request uh, and then uh, attach this dot then so that whenever the, re the request comes back, um, we see the data. Uh, now let's go on to our file here in the browser, refresh. And we get that fetch finish first, um, even though even though it was executed later, which was what Malik uh, found. And this is pretty interesting. Fetch starts later, yet it finishes first. And here, uh, this, the console logs are different just because data that payload here. Here we should have the same uh, console logs. Fetch finish earlier, Axios finish uh, later. Why do you think is that? What can you speculate about that? Um, wait, the, the, the refresh? Uh -huh. Oh, you, you're talking about, okay. Yeah, that's one option. Uh, what, what Alessandro is talking about is maybe they, maybe in terms of uh, time complexity, which is in terms of big O notation, maybe Axis is doing uh, an operation that is of n squared. And maybe fetch is doing something that is linear. That's, we don't know. That's per that's perfectly possible. Pupil? Yeah, I think that you said something about fetch being on handle, but maybe um, the access is on handle. Mm -hmm. The same one that's on handle. Yeah. Um, so I honestly don't know the right answer. I do feel inclined to think that is because access has more, uh, you know, because access is doing more of the heavy lifting for us. Uh, that will take it a little bit more time and end up being uh, a slower than fetch. I think the, the difference from a user standpoint will still be like minimal. Um, I guess we can measure how long it takes. Let's do let uh, start equal date dot now. Um, then let's do let axios end date now. Besides logging the data, I'm going to console log um, axios end minus start. Axios end minus start um, and fetch axios and minus start. That's it. Oh. Oh, this is not axios and uh, this is fetch end. Uh, let fetch end equal to date that now. This date that now just takes in the current time at whatever time this comes, uh, this line is run. Fetch Now, so we can see that the 
Oh, in this case, fetch finished earlier. <laughs> well, access finished earlier. Wait, let's get back to. Let's make sure I'm on fair game here. Online, console. Okay, fetch finished earlier. Here. Fetch finished earlier most times, and it's about the difference is about ten milliseconds. Which is a is a difference that we can ignore, right? From the user's perspective, that's no difference at all. Oh, now X is one. So, <laughs> there. Well, I'll just buy one, yeah. I'll, I'll not be surprised, yeah, if, if fetch uh, finish always earlier. Well, yeah. That's a fun little thing there. Um, yeah, this is, this is code. But yeah, we can see that. Uh, the difference is uh, is small, which is all that matters. But okay, now let's talk about uh, what are some of the differences that you see between Axios and Fetch. Cameron. Oh. Uh, I think. But what do you mean by JSON? Both of them are using JSON. Well, Axios will do that internally, but it still has right. to do it. So I was wondering if that extra step made it faster somehow, or just like, like it was processed in the code instead of being processed by someone? Yeah, uh, no, in this case, we will have to leave this a mystery. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel like fetch finish finishes faster 9 out of no. 9 out of 10. Oh, should we run it ten times and count? Yeah. Well, you got to refresh the page. Um, that's what I'm doing. One, I'm just looking. two. All right. So that was fetch. <laughs> Three, four, five, six. Now actually one. I mean, we I'm um, Axios. <laughs> But they're dealing with a different amount of data. This is in milliseconds, yeah. Yeah, but um, we can ignore. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, well, Axis 1 and this comparison that we, that Winter Health has made. You know what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh there's some differences. Oh, no. Performance. Uh, I'm gonna let you do, to explore this resource. I don't really get into that. Um, okay, so going back, what are some of the similarities and differences that you found between Axios and Fetch? Let's do similarities first. I mean. Both use promises. Both return promises. Although another one, somebody else. Similarities between fetch and axios. 
think that's the big, that's the uh, larger one. Yes. Both need URLs. Both need a URL as input. Yep, that's correct. Uh, sort of tied to this, since both return promises, both need uh, that then. Sort of, sort of a sub reason. Mm -hmm. Now the differences. Join. Oh, it's sure. Okay, yeah, they do both are sending get requests. Mm -hmm. So is that? That's a difference, right? Um, fetch. Oh, let's do that as uh, fetch doesn't parse the response data automatically. Or we could say the opposite, which is Axios does. Uh, Axios does parse the data automatically, converts it uh, to a JavaScript object. In fetch, we have to do um, response.json. Yes, Cameron? Um, very likely. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, we can try to uh, actually, if I go to this URL, which is has the code for Axios, the code that we saw earlier. Now here I'm going to do a command F and search for fetch. Oh, no. So there is no fetch inside of Axios. Maybe there is an XML HTTP request. There we go. So we found that Axios is using internally XML HTTP request. Malik? Yes, that's a good one. Fetch default is a get request. Or, or search by default will send a get request. Uh -huh. On Axios, we have to specify what kind of request it is. Fetch can also send post, uh, post requests, all the others, and same as XML HTTP requests. I saw some of you uh, sending post requests. For Fetch to send a post request, uh, we can do, I, I'm not gonna show you uh, here right now, but in the documentation, we can see um, here. This is an example for method, for the post method. What you can do is you use fetch. Uh, the first argument is the URL, and the second argument is an object. So far we have been passing in only one argument to fetch, uh, and it's only the URL. The second argument to fetch can be an object with options, um, and then in the options object, you could say method post. Uh, you could specify other stuff like credentials, headers, redirect, and the body. This body is the data that you want to send, the data that you want to post, or put, or patch. Um, cool. So I think any other difference? Oh, there's one. Well, actually, it's sort of a sub difference from this is because because fetch doesn't parse the response for us we need two that lens one for parsing um, two that. Oh. 
this pause data. Uh, any anything else to add here? Yes. Do you have to put a cache? Oh yes, this is a that's a good point that we forgot. Yes, uh, so you, you should have both should have a cache. That should be a similarity. Both should always have a catch. I mean, Uh -huh. On access for a post request, um, no, we will use uh, access that post instead of the options object. And how, how do you send oh, the second argument will be the data that you want to send. We're going to get to see that uh, next. Let me see any other differences or similarities that you guys recognize. I think I had a list here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, sort of in, in different words, only one dot then is needed. And Axios, automatic parsing of JSON, we talked about that. How we specify the request, might, um, Axios will allow us to do that get and that post. Uh, for doing a post on fetch, we need to pass that second argument. Um, oh, this is an important one. Axios is an external module, right? Um, something that we're importing. And fetch is built into the browser. Um, both return promises, both need at least one dot then and one dot catch, uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, okay, let's do let's make this fail and then let's take a five minute break. Um, so here we should also, as, as I said, we should always have a catch part because if not, then our code is just going to. Uh, throw an error and that might break the page for the user. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Recently I found an error that was not handling one uh, website, but I don't remember it. Um, so, how do we use the that catch again? Yeah, I'm going to comment out. I can send this file after one. Afterwards. I'm going to comment out this. Uh, no, I'm not going to come in yet. Um, how do we do a catch? So what happens is, actually, change this. Change uh, the URL at the beginning. Remove the F in the URL, even in both. Remove the F in the URL. Oh, this is actually what's going to be, I think, interesting. Um, I remove the F in the URL, which is the first part. You refresh the page, and you get my favorite thing to see, errors. So yeah, I, have, I, have, I even have some stickers. Um, so here is, oh, well, this one is um, an error that was just thrown on handle, on caught. Um, and we have the one for fetch, fell to, fell to fetch. So if we want to handle this and, and so that the user you see, we also get, oh, there's actually eight errors here going on. Uh, you see this eight number here? Two that get that were not found. One, access to XML HTTP request. Uh, so eight errors in total. If we don't want the user to see these errors, um, we have to handle them. Handling could be, what would be a good way to handle an error for a, from the user's perspective? Besides like not showing it. Peter? Yeah, I feel like the window alert, well, I wouldn't use the window that alert but I will use some uh, sort of notification kind of uh, pop-up that lets them uh, uh, know that something went wrong and say, maybe try later. 
It's just <laughs> what everyone say, try later, but um, you just, in this case, we'll say try later. <laughs> uh, and for, do, for doing that, well, we'll need that, that catch. Uh, that then will call a function like show error pop-up. And we'll show the pop-up. So in this case, uh, for handling this error, let's just do um, a console log. I'm going to add here. Here, I'm going to do, let's do this like that. Uh, lower that, that then to a separate line. This is still fine. And do that catch here. Here, just now. Uh, console.log the error. Or here we could just do, you know, oops. I don't know how you spell that. Maybe two B. Two O's. There was an error. Please try later. Just gonna actually this catch because both are returning promises. We'll uh, just need to copy it and paste it to the fetch. Um, now in that way we handle the error as I refresh. Uh, we still see six errors, uh, but these are, so we, we handle from these errors, I guess, we're seeing six errors, so eight in total. Eight in total was the ones that we were handling. And the, the four that we were seeing, or the six, no, wait, how many? Yeah, six. We were handling two. But they are, they are the same errors, but we're handling them here. Uh, that's why we see... Instead of eight, now we see six with our message. Right? This is what we will display the user. And then the browser, um, you know, the browser still has to show some errors for the developers. And or if the user is text savvy, they could see uh, and they could just inspect. But these errors, you know, there's there's no way to hide these errors. But most of your users will not know how to access the console. Only developers like you saw. Um, but yeah, in here you will just uh, handle those. So that's all. Let's take a five. Uh, let's take a break until nine, um, and be back for another way of handling errors. So wait, so how do you calculate that three and that? So for search, I have to have like a global variable. And initially I said it equals to third. Which is uh, one at the top and the very top, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And then uh, at the very beginning of the response, I read a sum of value. So they now minus stuff, right? But that's, oh, I see. But this is, um, this is once the response has arrived already. Okay. Yeah, which is not, is not very useful. I, I think it's about measuring before any request has been fired and once the request has succe uh, successfully been um, fulfilled. So, so like here what you're mentioning basically is the so thing from you, here. I think it's so when it starts. Like right here at line 24, it uh, acts as a function. Uh huh. Or, and then you will know that it ended once you are in the event then. Oh, once you're in the end? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So oh, so this me? marks the end of it. Because yeah, this, this, this marks from the dot then to the end of this. There is uh, just yeah, very little, like four yeah. milliseconds, seven milliseconds. So for fetch, it's longer. So like I was looking at this, right? Uh -huh. With, um, so this is the when you first get the response to fetch, which is at one seventeen. By the time you finish with all the data, it's at one twenty four, which is what this is. With Axios, the Axios response begins at 113 mm -hmm. and ends at 116. But I noticed that, like. I think that makes sense because, because the fetch, what you're measuring here is like, you're measuring from the, once they've su the response was successful until the response was completely parsed, which in Axios is all doing internal. So actually, because when when the when the response arrives from actions, the response is already parsed. So that means like you're not measuring in the fetch. You're measuring you're measuring the time that it takes to convert the response. In actions, you can't. Because so should we put the time right here? Um, like right here and right here. We put begin of that, and beginning of that, and okay, then we yeah. put it at the end of this. Yeah. And at the end of this, yeah. mm -hmm. calculate the difference. Yeah, and the difference will be, I think you should see what we were seeing here, which sometimes axes win, sometimes catch wins. Oh, Joy. Joy. He discovered the Easter egg. <laughs> the Easter egg that I left in the API. Oh. Yeah, and then I promised ten dollars to whoever found it. <laughs> I don't remember. That's fine. If you can send it on, on Slack or as a text message, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm. So I don't know how you would do it like on like a stats table. Like I'm not gonna take that phone.
Yeah, like the measuring the time of the error here doesn't make any difference. Well, the reason why I did it there. There will be like maybe one or two milliseconds of difference. But it does this because of the math you're doing, subtracting the smaller amount. No, the greater amount from the smaller amount. Okay, so so we are going to see what we need to see next is uh, let's post some data, posting some data with Axios, making a post request, and then something called async await. Um, so okay, let's do. In this case, I'm gonna leave this here. Uh, get to do get to do with fetch. I'm not going to use the get to do with fetch. I'm going to use the one with Axios. Um, well, here, what I want to do is I want to send a post request with Axios. And I'm going to uh, send a post request to add a new to do. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to add an input box here, type text, where the user will type in the to do placeholder to do um, that's it maybe maybe a uh, label to do I guess maybe an h1 to to do is app And then lastly, a submit button. Uh, this could be a button or a type input type submit. Value has to be um, add. So here I created, oh, I, this should also be it should all be inside inside of a form. So I have an H one uh, a form, a label, two inputs, one is a text box where they're going to type in a to-do, and the second one is the submit button. If we go to our page, let's go to all this, let's do this, refresh the page, we have our bare minimum to-do app. Yeah. Let's remove this label, I don't, I don't find it very pleasing. Let's just do it like that. Okay, so what we want to do is type in a to do here, like buy milk, uh, hit send or hit add, and make a network request to the backend, to the API to save that to do. Right. So, what I want to do is uh, make a post request to the API to save this to do uh, in the API, just like as we saw it using with Postman, 
Um, now we're actually making that request with JavaScript, which is a much, uh, much more fun. Uh, let's do that. So do you guys remember the to-dos API and what we need to do for uh, send, adding a new to-do? Let me show you a Postman. This is the way that we were looking at it in Postman. Do's API. So for sending a new to do here, we have to do specify the URL to be slash API slash to do's. This will be the endpoint. And we need to send the body with these two uh, pieces of data a text with the value with the actual to do content and an owner uh, of that to do. Right. So here I'm going to just hard code the owner, um, but this text I'm going to grab from whatever the user types in that uh, text box. And then once we hit send here in Postman, it will add that to do to our to do's and we should be able to retrieve it. Um, I'm not going to hit it in here. I want to do this again with uh, the JavaScript that we now know and with Axios. So let me close this. HTML. Okay, so first I want to grab the value from whatever they type in here. Uh, we can do that by um, having a function. Actually, let's do so. Okay, so we need to grab the value, whatever they type in here, like buy milk. We need to grab this value whenever the form is submitted. Like whenever I hit add, or whenever I hit enter, which is also nice. So that sounds like I need to listen for an event, right? What event is that? The submit event. And where would I listen for that event? I mean? In the form, yes, uh, because only forms uh, generate submit events. So, okay, so that means I have to uh, grab the form, add the event listener. Um, I to grab the DOM to grab the form, I will need to uh, make sure that the DOM has been loaded. Um, so here, I'm going to create a function called setup form listener. What is this function going to do? It's going to set up the form listener. Uh, for doing that, then I'm, uh, and then I'm going to just call it here. Uh, set up form listener. And I call that as soon as the DOM has loaded. Uh, for setting up the form listener, I want to grab the form, so I'm going to do let form equal document that query selector and I grab it by the, by the tag name just form no need for hashtag or period and then I'm going to do form that add of that listener uh, the event that I want to listen for is the submit event and here um, I'm going to write the function that will be fired once the submit event happens So as soon as the form is submitted, what I want to do is I want to grab the input box, read the value from inside, and then send that data in my network request, in my post uh, request that I'm going to do with Axios. So to grab the value of the input box, well, I'll need the input box. I'll need to first grab the input box. So let's do let input box equal document dot query selector oh here I have a little bit of a problem you could say 
which is I have two inputs, so I can do this. Well, I could do this. I have in my form, I have two inputs. One is the input box, as you can see here, the, the input type text, and another one is the input type submit. So if I try to grab it by name, query selector um, it will only give me one, and it will give me the first one, which uh, I think it will be fine for this. But yeah, stupid. Could you use query selector Yes, but I'm actually only interested in one, which is the input type text. Uh, what are some options? Yes. Um, Giving an ID will be the best option. Yes, thank you. Um, just to clarify, even if I don't give it an ID and I do this, it will still work, but it will, I'll have to be a little bit more careful uh, because if the button, if the submit button is before the text, this, the input uh, box type text, then the submit will be selected. And I don't want that. But just to be safe, I prefer to give it an ID. Um, uh, let's call this to do text. To do input, just that. To do input. Uh, and here, query selector, I'm just going to write by the ID. To do dash input. Let's call this to do input too. Then here I could do, um, I can now grab the value of this to do input by saying to do that input. I mean? Oh, that's a good point. I still want to prevent the default. Let's do, let's try to do this. Console.log uh, to do input that value. Um, so here I grab the, uh, the input box here, and now I'm trying to read the value property of that object. Um, so as soon as I load this page, the get to do's function gets fired. After that, the setup um, form listener will be fired. And let's look and see what we have in the console for now. Oh, we have our broken uh, link still. Let me remove this. Or let me just add the F back. Refresh. And we have the Axios request um, console login. So, okay. Now, if I try to type something here, let's do by milk. And I had try to send that. Right, which is the form, the submitted event will be fired in the form. I try to add, and really quickly, here we see a console log and everything happens again. Uh, just do by here. Here the console log will happen really fast uh, as I click it. And then it gets erased because, um, as Amin was pointing out, we need to prevent the default uh, in the uh, submit event or in the form. Because the default behavior of a form is when it's trying to be submitted to refresh the page. Uh, in this case, well, not only ref refresh the page, but I also try to send the information of the form. But in this case, we want to control the, the sending of the information of the form. Uh, we want to send it manually with Axios. So I want to prevent the default. Um, to prevent the default, I need to access the event argument that the listener uh, gets passed. And we do that by doing adding it here in the argument, event.prevent default. First thing that I want to do, prevent that default there. Um, now here, let's refresh the page. As I hit add, nothing, uh, the page is no longer refreshing. Um, I see some console log popping up here. Let's type in buy milk. I hit add. And therefore, I hear, because I have console.log on line 14 to do input.value, we get the value of that box, of that text box. This shouldn't be totally uh, foreign to us. 
Okay, now once we have the value or any questions to this point. Once we have this value, what we want to do is make the network request to send it to our API. We're going to make that network request, which has to be a post request. Uh, we're going to make it with Axios and provide the data that we want to send. Um, okay, so now, so now I have the input value. Uh, now we're about to make the network request. Making the network request, um, I can think of uh, this as in two steps. One, get the value from the uh, text box, and after that, then send the network request. So I'm going to create another function here. Say const, uh, let's call it add to do, or send to do. I think maybe send send to do here I'm gonna pass in the something called the to-do text which is guess what the to-do input value this guy I'm gonna pass in this guy to the send to do so in fact let's just do call here send to do um, instead of console logging that value, I'm going to send to do and I'm going to pass in this uh, the value of the input box. Could also create a variable here. This could also be an option. And then after that, send the to-do. Console, console log about to send to-do. Now let's check up until this point. We're not making the network request yet. Let's check that everything just works up until this point. Let's see if we, if we got this in here. Do, and actually here, let's do to-do. to console log whatever gets passed to the send to do. So if we have everything correct, as we hit submit, this function will be, no, this function will be fired, the one in here. Uh, we're gonna prevent the default, uh, we grab the input, we grab the input value, and we call send to do with that. Let's see what we have, refresh the page here. Uh, actually, I'm gonna remove the access console log, which is starting to bother me and also this stuff about the time I think we still have it in fetch um, let's save that refresh okay so here let's try uh, by milk, try to send, and we have to we have our console log popping up from line 20, line 20. Console log about to send to do by milk. Okay, so so far we have everything hooked up correctly here, and our function send to do is about uh, to uh, or is being called. Any questions here so far? So now this function is the one that is going to make the network request. To make the network request, we were going to use Axios. Axios. Uh, now what kind of network request we want to make get put patch post 
with axes we do that axes.post now to what URL are we going to uh, post the data to the same one so I'm going to copy this line from here paste it here uh, we want to send that data to the same URL as you can see on Postman the same URL that you get the, the to do's from but in this case with a get you get you post to with a post request so we do access.post and in here I need to specify the second argument to uh, access.post which we didn't use when we were doing that simple get the second argument to the post has to be this data that we want to send. Here I'm going to call, I'm going to create a variable here called data to send. Let's say equal to, well, what data do I want to send? I want to send my to do text. Let's, let's see this. And then I'm going to say here, you're all the second argument data to send. So we saw that the to do text is this string here called buy milk. And we're trying to send that data. Um, this is going to fail at first because we saw that to add a new to do, we need two pieces of data, which is the to do text and the owner of that to do. Well, let's see what we get. Uh, we do access.post and then we do that then response console.log response dot data. The data that comes back gets uh, it gets put on the response uh, that data property and then here that catch to handle the error let's do a console log to do couldn't be added So we saw that the send to do function was being fired as we saw this console log being uh, registered. The final URL, we define a variable called data to send. The data that we want to send is the to do text. Um, and then we do access.post. We give the URL where we want to post the data to. And the second argument is the data to send. After that, we do add that then to listen for when the request was successful and add dot catch if the request um, is rejected or the promise is rejected um, and this should be it at least uh, for now we're going to see something interesting happening but any questions uh, up until this point what would we do if we wanted to do a put request instead of a post what would I change If we want to, you do a put request instead of a, yes, here we just do put. Here we change this to be the method that we want. But in this case, I want to do a post request. So I'm going to leave it post. Um, that's it, I think. Uh, let's see what we got. All this is happening. This function will be fired. Um, and some other stuff happens when the form is submitted, when we listen uh, for this event. So let's see what we have. Refresh this page. Let's do by milk. Hit add. And we get about to send by milk. And after that, we get an error post. 
with a 400 saying bad request. To do couldn't be added, error. Request fail with status 400. So the request is being fired, as we can see in the network tab. The to do's, uh, oh, the, that first one, this first one was to get all the to do's. We can see the method here. That one was successful. The second one was a push request to this URL. Oh, and also here in the network tab, we can see uh, the data that we try to send, which is this thing, thing called form data. We can see the view source. This is the data that we're sending. The problem here is, well, the, net, the network request is failing because the API is not expecting the data in this format like that. The API, well, for one, the API is also expecting an owner, right? And it's expecting a text, which in this case will be a no. So the API is expecting something like the one that what we're seeing here, which is a piece of data associated uh, to an owner and a piece of data associated to something called a text. So, so far the server is replying with a 404 saying we have a bad request and indeed we have a bad request. We're not sending all the information and the information is not being, we don't have the association between an owner um, and the piece of data in a text. So for doing that, turns out that we, what we want to send actually is not this string. We want to send an object. We want to send an object where we have two keys. One will be text and another one will be owner. And the key text will hold the value uh, by milk and the key owner will hold the value of a username. So let's do that here. Instead of data to send being this string, the text to do, I'm gonna make this an object this object has to have two properties, the same properties that the API is expecting. One is called text. And this text property must have the to do text. The other property that the API is expecting um, is an owner. In this case, I'm gonna hard code myself here. And then this is the data that we want to send. We give this object to the axios that post as the second argument. Um, axios will try to send this data. For those of you that saw how to send the post request with fetch, uh, there was one extra step that you needed to do, which was uh, to convert this object into a JSON string. You needed to convert this object to a JSON string. That's another thing that Axis is doing for us. Um, and you will convert this object to a JSON string with um, JSON.stringify, which is the opposite of JSON.parse. Uh, but thanks to Axis, we don't have to do that. Axis will do that for us. Um, we have the object with the two um, properties and the right data in. This should succeed now. Let's see. Refresh this page here. Um, by milk, add, we got something happening, 204, oh this is an options, and we got a 201, um, so we have two requests, one options, another one post, uh, the options is being created automatically, no, don't worry about it. Here we have the post data, we saw that we have a green status 201, just created. We can see as we scroll down, we can see the data that we sent. This is the data that we sent, right? This data is raw text that was made out of um, a JavaScript object internally by um, Axios. Axios to the JavaScript object and it converted it to raw text to a JSON string. And I put it here in the request, see view parse. Um, and then this data was sent to the API. Um, the API is 
accepted it because it says 201 created. And as we go here to the response, um, we can see that a new to do with this ID ending in 80 was created with the text that we sent by milk. Completed false, error false. So now if we go, if we had an option to get an element, get a to do by ID, which I think we have in here, I hope. Do we have that here? Oh yeah. This is this is still with Postman. I'm gonna send that because that's the idea of the to do that I just added. I get it back here. So this is how we send a post request with Axios. Axios.post, the URL, the data to be sent. Did you try it yourself? Owen? Uh -huh. there, somewhere there must be a mistake because the URL is the same. So I could have the URL as a global variable and it should still work. Um, here, let's try it. I'm going to cut, cut this from here and put it uh, as a global variable. URL, um, even remove it from here. I'll just comment it as I go to the browser. Refresh. Hello, 6.2. Add. We get a 201 created. The response. Hello, 6.2. So mine worked. So you must have some uh, difference uh, in the URL somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. So like the next step here will be, which we actually don't have time for, will be to display the recently added to do uh, right underneath to the, in a list, right? Uh, in an app, that's what you do when you add a new to do, you immediately see it at underneath. Uh, that'll, we'll have to build that functionality into. But um, this is how we can send a post request with actions, which was the main point. Other questions, what can I re-explain here? Come in. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Yes. The endpoints you're posting seem to not require anything above. Can you just simply do what you did first, which is state the, the basically the data, mm -hmm. the new text? Wait, say that again? And so, but, um, so there's two points to your question, which is if you're making a post request, mm -hmm. is because you're sending some data. Right. Um, a post request should not have an empty body because then otherwise, like, for that you can just do a get request. Um, but I think, but the second part that you were saying, like, well, if I had set up my uh, API to just receive that string of text, bare string of text, uh, then I would have done it, uh, as you were saying, just the data to send be equal to the to do text. Mm -hmm. It's just that I set up my API to accept data in this format, in uh, this format here. And what format is this? What format is data that looks like this? JSON. So I set up my API to accept JSON data.
Other comments? Questions? Yes. Could we also target uh, completed as well? Um, uh huh. Um, what do you mean, like sending completed? Within within the, the object of the sending or the proposal. Uh huh. Um, so in this case, it would be. So you're saying like. Yeah. So so uh, damage to send would be text, mm -hmm. new text, owner, uh, way to go to the seven mm -hmm. three. And also completed true. Okay, no. So yeah. So we could send we can send completed here. I think if I don't remember if I remember correctly, I set up the API, uh, which you're gonna get to do uh, on the next unit, create your own API. I set up my API to not allow you to send a to do completed uh, when you first make a to do. Because if you think about it, like if you're just creating that to-do and it's by default completed, why would you want that in the first place? Right. Um, I think if I send here true, my API just ignores this piece of data. Uh, we can see that the response is giving us back uh, completed false because that's how I set it up. So that when you add a to-do, it's by default set up to false. Um, the completed set up to false. Now I change that to try to send the completed true and uh, maybe maybe I let's let's see. Um, why beans? Wait, did I refresh? Yeah. Add to do uh, this. This was uh, when it went well. This is the data that we sent. Uh, let's see if they completed took effect. Yeah. It's still false. Is because the API is ignoring anything else that is not owner or text. I didn't I set it up that way. Yes, Yuan. Sure. Oh. You tell me where, I guess here? No. This is the get to do's. Um, oh, sorry. Other questions? So, what we're about to learn in these 20 minutes that we have left is how to get rid of the that catch and that then. So that our code is a little bit more, it, it will it will still work. It will read um, it will read a little bit better. Uh, so we we turn it turns out that we have a way to replace this that catch uh, and that then, and our code will uh, will read a little bit better. Um, damn. So we. So we do that. So there's this thing, these two keywords called async and await. Um, async is a, is a keyword that we can just put on in front of any function. Um, so leaving this aside for a little bit, I'm gonna do function. So for instance, what we have here is, um, we have this send to do function, right? That is that is doing some asynchronous stuff of uh, sending a network request. So I can make an asynchronous function by doing uh, let's do it first ES5 function or async function. Uh, let's do like I don't know. Uh, let's try send to do two. So I can mark a function as an async function. And if I mark a function to be an async function, an asynchronous function, this function. So wait, let's do like if I call this function here. 
send to do two. What am I going to see in, in the console? If I define a function, it's empty, and then I call it, I invoke it. What would I see in the console? <coughs> I'll see see undefined. That is because this function doesn't return anything. It returns to I'll see value two. So if a function doesn't have a return, implicitly it returns undefined. This is something we have talked about in the past. Now, so it's returning that value, right? Now note what happens if I do async in front of it. I put async in front of the function and I refresh. What is it returning now? Our good friends, the promise. So uh, if you mark, if you make a, a function, if you prepend a function with the word async, uh, it will by default return a uh, promise. So this is to also say, like, um, do you guys remember how we can create our own promises? It's saying, like, let my promise equal new promise, reject, resolve, and reject. Right? So we could just have a function like this, async, instead of creating our own um, promise the other way, and this function by default would already return a promise. Right. Um, and here we can see that because, because um, the work of this function takes no time at all, the, the promise is by default already resolved. Because, you know, returning to takes no time. There's nothing sort of, it's not, it's not dealing with the outside world. Uh, the promise is already resolved uh, just because of that, but we're going to get to see like why this is interesting. So this is the ES5 version. ES5. Let's do the ES6. ES6 will, will be const first. Let's do const then the name, then the arrow, and async will go here. Actually, no, that doesn't look right. This is an equal, and then this is the arrow. Async goes in here. So if I do send to do ES6, I should still see the same promise being console mode. Mm -hmm. Our send to do ES6, uh, is returning a promise. So what async will let us do is mark our function as asynchronous and then wait for the result to come back instead of having to do uh, that thing. Let me look back at here. Yeah. Right, so if we have this function that returns a promise, um, so if we have this, this, this function returns a promise, right? On any promise, we can do that then. Do console log promise resolve and then the value rest. Rest here is the value that the promise will resolve to. So this part here is an async function. It returns a promise. On that promise, I can do at that end. So 
So I'm going to refresh the page. And we get that the problem is resolved, and the value that it resolved to is 2. So this is all fine, but we don't want to, what we want to do is not keep doing the that then. We want to see um, a more straightforward way. So that's where the other keyword comes in, the await keyword. notes here. Yeah. So, okay, now sort of introducing this into the context of the, um, into the context of the send to do, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this function to be an asynchronous function. I made the send to do uh, an asynchronous function. Now an asynchronous function will return a promise, right? But more importantly, inside we could use the await keyword and we're going to get rid of all this so note how we're going to be using that we do first I'm going to create a variable called result equal to await and what do I want to await the actions that post Actually, let's call this response. Here, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna need this anymore. I change this to be to use async await. And here I will have here the response once uh, we let's do something like console log right here response dot data I made this function to be an asynchronous function. An asynchronous function can await. If you if you try to await on a non-asynchronous function, you should see an error. Let's try that first. I'm gonna remove the async from here from to do and refresh. I've tried to add a to do, oh actually uh, we already get the error which is await is only valid in an async function. So if you want to use await to wait for the result of this, that's what await will do. It will allow you to wait for the resolution of this promise. So and now I have to do async here just because I had removed it. So the function is marked as async. I have a wait in front of my post. I refresh and we have, um, well our problem is resolved, that's this part here. That was sort of the introduction. Now let's try to add a to do. Now 
Now I send, I'm going to send this to do. And we get that the data about to send it to do by potatoes. Um, then we see the response here, the data that came back coming in from index.js line 31. So here we have our data being sent as we see in the network. We have a 201 created. The buy potatoes to do was added to our API and we didn't need to use uh, that then. Uh, we just switched to having the function being async and then using await before the promise. This part is the part that returns a promise. We do await here and that will make it um, sort of wait, right? That's why it's called wait until moving to the next line, right? And then we console log the response that data. So this here, async await is syntactic sugar. It was made to make asynchronous code look like synchronous code, where one thing happens after the other, right? That's what we call synchronous code. Uh, everything happens uh, one thing after the other in order, in sequential order. And asynchronous code um, is non sequential. But async await allows to think of asynchronous code as if it was. Synchronous code. Yes, Peter? That's a great question. How do you do the catch in here? Uh, that is the next and last point, which is so here, let's look at what happened. So this was able to add a new to do um, because we saw the response that data. Now let's try to make it break. I'm going to change the URL to the non-existent URL by removing the F. I refresh. Now I, oh, well, one, we get the, we get this error because um, we have that other function that is trying to get all the to-dos. So that one fails too. That one is still using um, the that then right here. But now let's see how the other one fails. Um, add and we have 404 here and we have an on caught in promise network error so we are back to having an on caught promise and we don't want to have on caught errors so for catching this error um, we could use the all that catch, but there is a better way, which is the try catch block. So we can use a try here. This is another keyword, so we have seen four keywords. Try. So I wrap this. I wrap some statements, I wrap these statements to be tried, and one of these, in this case, this is throwing an error, right? So I, we try these statements, we, like JavaScript will try to execute them, and if any one of these throws an error, then we can catch it, because we will do try catch. So you, when you're doing async await like this, you want to make sure that your await statements are wrapped by a try. And, and following the try, you will want a catch. As we try this again, let me uh, remove these other errors. 
detergent add. Now we successfully have cached the error and display a message saying, oops, there was an error. Try it later. So great question. This is how we will catch an error in using async await. We will wrap, we can wrap anything. This is not only true to await, but we can wrap anything that will throw an error in a try and catch the error in a catch. Anything that will throw an error that you think might throw an error, you could wrap in a try and then catch the error in the catch statement. Yeah, so that is uh, all for today. That was another jam-packed day, <laughs> right? Um, my suggestion would be try to get comfortable with Axios, read the lecture notes. Um, again, for the exam, you are free to use either Axios, or Fetch, or XML HTTP request. Um, please, uh, before you leave, uh, just to get a sense of how much uh, um, how much we managed to deliver and uh, you to absorb, please uh, complete the exit ticket and then you are free to go. We have more control uh, as to what is what constitutes an error. So yeah, actually we'll uh, see a 404 and we'll throw an error. So yeah, like the if the GitHub um, page is using access, then that will be the catch. I have a, a few more things, a few like announcements to make, which is, um, so tomorrow Ben is coming for the DSA and hash maps. Uh, that should be interesting. Um, and for that first hour, um, I w we're thinking of doing a review. I think I'll prefer to, you know, rather than a targeted review, for you to keep working in the, uh, um, the assignment, right? The the one that will be due on Friday, loading data, which you know just practice about uh, getting um, data from outside sources. Uh, so I think for we could work uh, on that for that first hour tomorrow. Um, and also on Saturday we have you know assignment review and unit two review uh, here. 
uh, we're just going to be yeah, reviewing this stuff that we saw over the past week uh, before going in, well, not only over the past week, but on, over the um, this last unit and whatever is coming in the unit to review. Again, here maybe I'll, I'll prepare something for you know a more targeted review as to a very sort of a condensed um, maybe half a day lecture on everything that we saw in this past unit uh, and then maybe some practice in the afternoon um, right before the unit 2 assessment. Remember that you'll have the entire day for that. Questions about the plan ahead? Cool. Thank you very much.